If you could visit any place in the world, where would you want to go? Many would instantly say Tahiti and the South Pacific. Well then, come with me on a fantastic journey to beautiful Pitcairn Island. We will travel through Tahiti, Point Venus, and Matavea Bay, where the bounty anchored in 1788 to collect breadfruit trees. Visit the center of Tahiti, where very few go, to Papieti and its famous market. Fly through the Tuamotos to Mangareva, where the finest Tahitian pearls come from. Witness a green flash. Explore Mangareva and get on three different vessels for the final leg to Pitcairn Island. This young, active volcano lies only 68 miles southeast of Tahiti. Our first glimpse of Tahiti is of Tahiti Iti, the southern part of the island. Just to the right of center, you can see Tautira Bay. Tautira is located as far away as you can get from the Tahitian capital of Papieti. This photo was taken in the 1920s. My photo from the same location 100 years later shows very little change. In 1886, the author Robert Louis Stevenson stayed here and referred to Tautira as the Garden of the World. We are looking north toward the main island of Tahiti Nui. In front of us is the isthmus that connects the two parts of Tahiti. What a breathtaking sight of Tahiti Nui. At the rocky point are two blowholes. One puts on a dramatic show even on a calm day, and the other up on the road is only active when the sea is very rough. Let's take a trip inland to the center of Tahiti, one of the wettest places in the Pacific. Today is a rare day with hardly a cloud in the sky. Our goal is to reach an unfinished tunnel about 10 miles inland. It was cut through a mountain to link the east and west coast by road. Walking here is very safe. There are no poisonous snakes or insects in French Polynesia. This is a perfect setting for the next Jurassic Park. The hillsides are scarred with numerous waterfalls that flow with the near constant rain up here in the mountains. The center of the island typically receives over 1700 millimeter or 69 inches of rain in a year. The best deal in the South Pacific is a room in this moss covered hotel for only $50 a night. Finally, we arrive at the abandoned tunnel at the top of Tahiti. This is all that remains of an attempt to build a road across the island. Whatever goes up, must go down. This is the way back to the coast and my car. On the east side of Tahiti, there are very few coral reefs because of the countless rivers and streams that flow into the ocean. This abundance of fresh water prevents coral from growing. A few miles from Point Venus, we come across this mystical tree. You just have to stop and wonder how it gets its nourishment. This black sand beach just east of Point Venus is very popular with surfers and kite sailors. We are now at the most northern part of Tahiti, Point Venus. The bay to the right of Point Venus is Matavea Bay, where one of the greatest sea stories of all time unfolded, the mutiny on the bounty. The bounty arrived here on the 26th of October in 1788. Here is a scene from the 1962 movie, Mutiny on the Bounty, and what the same location looks like today. Straight ahead of us is where most of the breadfruit trees were made ready to board the bounty. These are some spectacular shots taken during the filming of the movie. The Bounty crew spent five months cultivating over 1,000 breadfruit plants to be transported to Jamaica. Breadfruit is usually baked whole on an open fire or cut into thin slices and fried like potato chips or french fries. To further aggravate Captain Bly, the mutineer spitefully tossed the trees into the sea as he drifted away in the launch. Yeah. What are you making? I'm making breadfruit chips, Tony. 
and he, she, he's making some milk. Never mind. These are the yummiest breadfruit that are on Pitkin Island. He's the Island. good cooker. So looks like. This is what it looks like. This is the trouble that caused the mutiny. The point ahead is One Tree Hill, where my drone will shortly crash. It ran out of power due to very strong winds. In 1769, while on board Captain Cook's ship, the Endeavour, John Hawksworth made this engraving of Matavea Bay and Point Venus from the top of One Tree Hill. The Hotel Tahara is perched on the south side of One Tree Hill and was once the place to stay while visiting Tahiti. This is the view from the same location today. James Norman Hall and Charles Nordoff, authors of Mutiny and the Bounty, are sitting on the future site of the Hotel Tahara in the 1930s. Here is the same view today. Point Venus Lighthouse was erected in 1867. Captain Cook observed the transit of Venus from this spot in 1769. Locals and tourists are enjoying the exotic black sand beach of Matavea Bay. One of the most historic sites in the South Pacific, Point Venus, Matavea Bay, and One Tree Hill. The wind has suddenly come up and well beyond the capabilities of the drone. It is going sideways faster than it is moving ahead. I start dropping altitude in an attempt to get out of the strong winds up above. We are still going sideways much faster than we're moving forward. I start to panic. The battery went quickly to 40% because the motors are fighting the wind and to make matters worse, I have all my pit cairn footage on board. I set my sights on the closest land, which is One Tree Hill. Getting the drone back to Point Venus is now not an option. I can see flat water ahead, an area with no wind. The battery is now down to 13% as I approach the calm area. I throttle back to 90% to save power and I thought by turning off the camera I might save even more. The drone arrived over the rocks on the left side of One Tree Hill with only 3% battery power remaining. As soon as it reached the beach, the goggles went dark, the battery was dead, and the drone fell out of the sky. On arriving at the crash site, I asked a few residents if they had seen a drone come ashore. No one did. I was about to give up looking when I saw it in pieces between some rocks no more than 15 feet from the ocean, just in front of the large building on the left side of One Tree Hill. Without question, if I didn't turn off the camera, I would have lost everything, including my Pitcairn footage. I learned a valuable lesson that day to always back up. Now we get to visit the James Norman Hall Museum with our host Vivian, who is extremely knowledgeable when it comes to the story of the Bounty and Tahiti. A look at Mr. Hall's bedroom, furnished as it was when he lived here from 1925 until 1951. I have just returned from Pitcairn and preparing to show my photographs and talk to an audience at the museum. There will be great local fruit to be sampled while watching the film and photos under the stars.
The capital is Papiete, which means water basket in Tahitian. Near the middle of the picture, you can see the spire of one of the oldest buildings in the South Pacific, the Notre Dame Cathedral that opened in 1875. And this is one of the last examples of colonial architecture on the island. These vintage photographs show the church has changed very little over the years. We are now at the public market offering the most colorful and exotic fruit and fish. Picton Castle has just arrived in Tahiti from Pitcairn Island on her round-the-world cruise. Imagine doing this in a heavy sea. This is the entrance to Papieti Bay, with the island of Morea in the background. My first trip to Tahiti was in 1970, while sailing around the world with my parents, brother and sister, on our 47-foot trimaran, the Lorelei 3. The international airport that opened in 1960. Ahead is the marina where visiting yachts from all around the world anchor. A trip to Tahiti is not complete without a stop at the Captain Bly restaurant for some fresh mahi-mahi. The restaurant will be our launching pad for our next drone adventure. It is very difficult navigating boats inside the reef because of the many coral heads that lie just under the surface. Over the horizon, 700 miles away, lies Rarotonga and the Cook Islands. Tahiti was thrust up from the ocean floor millions of years ago. The island originally extended all the way to the edge of the reef. Because the weight of the island is too great for its foundation, it has sunk to where it is today. In a few more million years, Tahiti may be entirely below the surface and then become an atoll. An atoll is an island that is completely submerged below the surface, leaving only a ring of coral. The Captain Bly restaurant is below us with the long jetty on the right. We are now looking southeast. Tahiti Iti is just around the corner. Tahiti was originally settled by Polynesians 1,500 years ago and proclaimed a colony of France in 1880. Juan Fernandez discovered the island in 1576. The first European to visit was Captain Samuel Wallace on the Dolphin, sighting the island on June 18, 1767. Papieti is at the top of the picture. One more look at Morea, then back to Captain Bly's for lunch. These pictures are from this lagoon in front of the Captain Bly restaurant. The most abundant species of shark on the reefs in the South Pacific is the black tip reef shark. The ocean around Tahiti is so warm that as soon as the sun rises, evaporation occurs creating a haze. Getting a clear photograph of Morea is nearly impossible. This is a typical photo. Your reward for getting up early in the morning is a stunning view of this magnificent island that lies only 10 miles away from Tahiti.
Morea means yellow lizard and is a name taken from a family of chiefs that lived on the island. Our plane is landing for tomorrow's flight to Mangareva. A last look at the setting sun behind Morea. I am practicing stop motion photography in low light and was able to get this image of a horse in the flames of a tiki torch along with my initials TP. This is the most exciting part of the journey to Pitcairn, where you can see an abundance of atolls and coral reefs from the air. French Polynesia is made up of 118 islands and atolls that cover over 2 million square miles of the South Pacific, which is the equivalent to the size of Europe. Tahitians are the friendliest people in the world. With the camera set at five thousandths of a second, I was able to stop this propeller in motion. And here is our first atoll. I am not going to try to pronounce their names. We are arriving at our first fuel stop on Hau Atoll. This sculpture was here in 2010 and gone on my next trip. From down here, it looks like a long way to the other side of the lagoon. We make another fuel stop and a place to stretch our legs on Turia Atoll. Fuel tanks are full and it's time to say goodbye to Toria. Here is the infamous Mururo Atoll where the French tested their atomic bombs from 1966 to 1996. 
The HMS Swallow, the ship that discovered Pitcairn Island in 1767, a few days later also discovered both Mururoa and Maria Atolls. Finally, we have arrived at the outer reef of Mangareva. It is quite possible no one has ever set foot on these tiny islands or snorkeled on the reef. You can only imagine the visual treasures hidden below the surface. There is not enough flat land on the main island for an airport, so the runway was built on the outer reef. We will be taking a ferry the five and a half miles to the town of Rikatia. There are seven of us heading to Pitcairn. Sue in the front is going back home to the island, along with Jackie Christian in the red shirt. The rest of us are just visitors to the island. Let's take a quick tour around Mangareva by air. As you can see, the water is strikingly clear, where you can see the bottom almost 200 feet down. The buildings you see on the water are where the Tahitian pearl farmers live and work. The white buoys scattered about the lagoon hold strings of oyster shells, and inside, the treasured pearls. Shortly, we will see the most amazing pearls in the world. Let's visit the main island of Mangareva and the town of Rikatia. The passage to the dock is riddled with small reefs and is impossible to navigate through at night. After weaving our way through the small reefs, we arrive at the main jetty where we see our ship, the Claymore 2, which took me to Pitcairn on three of my five trips. For those who like prehistoric shark movies, you might recognize the Claymore. She was used in the 2018 movie, The Meg. The other two trips were on sailing yachts, the Southern Cross of Take Me to Pitcairn fame, and the Explore. Meet Eves, who we stayed with during the Take Me to Pitcairn episode. This is the main street of Rikatia and the church. This is how the church looked on my first trip, before they started a major renovation and by my third trip, it was completely restored. We are on the road to the top of the island. From this vantage point, we see the homes over the water where the pearl farmers live and work, and the many buoys that hold strings of Tahitian pearls. Here is a mountain of discarded black-lipped oyster shells that have already had their pearls removed. Pearls, anyone? Fortunately, I was able to get into the back rooms where they were sorting the pearls by size and color. I did end up bringing a few of these pearls home. Blue is one of the rarest colors. These earrings are the bluest I have ever seen.
These are the most exquisite pearls. They belong to Eve's, and this is his daughter, Yavani, wearing them. The colors are absolutely stunning. My new friend is wearing my great white shark tooth that was caught off Australia in 1959. Eves is sitting on a natural stone seat that overlooks the town and the beautiful waters of Rikatia. We will be passing these islands on the outer reef on our way to Pitcairn Island. If you have seen the documentary, Take Me to Pitcairn, made by Julian McDonald, then you will recognize a few of these shots. Here is Julian shooting a scene for his now famous documentary. This is Eve's house where we stayed while waiting for the Southern Cross. And here's the Southern Cross finally arriving and Julian shooting another scene for his documentary. Now it's time to get on board the Claymore 2 for our final leg to Pitcairn. It must have been nerve-wracking navigating in the 17 and 1800s with no charts or modern navigation equipment. This is a small reef in the middle of the channel. You will now see one of the rarest events on this planet, the elusive green flash. I have never witnessed it during our 14 years I spent at sea until I took this photo off Mangareva. Getting ready to leave port on the Southern Cross. On May 25, 1797, Mangareva was discovered by Captain Wilson on a ship named the Duff. He named the highest point on Mangareva Mount Duff after his ship. Rikatia has to be one of the most picturesque towns in the South Pacific. We are saying goodbye to Mangareva. An uninhabited island on Mangareva's outer reef. This low-lying atoll is only 30 miles from Rikatia. Our last stop, just over 230 miles from Mangareva, is Owino, the first of four islands that make up the Pitcairn Islands. The others are Ducey, Henderson, and of course, Pitcairn. We see a humpback whale spouting just off the reef. These are vintage photographs taken around 1960 of the Pitcairn Islanders taking a vacation to Owino. The girl on the right with her head on the side of the boat is Brenda. And here's what she looks like today. My first trip here was on the Southern Cross in 2010.
I am seeing Pitcairn for the first time. It is truly a rock in the middle of nowhere. This is my favorite photograph of the island. And finally, we arrive in Adamstown. Sailing is a totally different experience compared to the Claymore. Sue on the left is returning to Pitcairn. Lydia on the right is from Germany and visiting Pitcairn for the first time. Having fun dancing to the wind gods. The wind is lightened up and we will do anything that can help us get to Pitcairn tomorrow. And Lydia is sharpening her helmsmanship skills on the Explorer. Jackie Christian is the seventh generation granddaughter of Fletcher Christian of the Bounty. She is returning to Pitcairn Island after a trip to New Zealand, and as you can see, quite happy to see her home. On one of my trips to Pitcairn, we arrived at night and I was able to capture these pictures of Pitcairn lit only by the Moon and Venus. This is our first sighting of Pitcairn aboard the Claymore. Here's the Claymore's bridge, the main lounge, and my very comfortable cabin. A glimpse of Pitcairn through the bridge window. As you can see, Pitcairn Island is very rugged and has almost no flat land. Great view of Adamstown from the north. Launching and retrieving the longboat to visit ships in the early to mid 1900s was quite an ordeal and needed the muscle power of almost every able bodied person. Getting out through the surf was not an easy feat either. The long boats are coming out to pick us up and take us ashore. Yeah. 
I will be staying with Pirate Paul in the black shirt with the skull and crossbones, along with his mate, Buccaneer Sue. And once again, here's Brenda. She's going to be stamping our passports. And now we're on our way into Bounty Bay. Paul is proudly wearing the pirate hat I brought for him. 